And a good evening to you. I'm Mike Schneider, the managing editor of NJTV's nightly news program, NJ Today. And I'm Rafael Piramon, anchor of WLIW and 13th News Magazine, Metro Focus. We're going to get right to the latest news for you right now. Millions of people without electricity throughout the tri-state region. Officials say Hurricane Sandy caused the worst damage in the history of their companies. Downed wires, fallen trees, flooding, blocking repair crews. In Newark, more than 9 percent, 90 percent. If you can believe that, 90% of the residents spent the day in the dark. Although power is starting to come back, their flooding is severe. And in the East Village, well, in the, uh, the Con Ed substation exploded in flames last night. Amazing scene. There it is. Power is still off in much of lower Manhattan. Trains in both New Jersey, New York, and, and Long Island, for that matter, shut down. We will show you what has happened to New York West subways. More of this video is coming up from the MTA. The subways, needless to say, when you see scenes like this, watch this right now, they're completely shut down. Officials are reporting 48 people have lost their lives in this region. Many of them have been killed because trees have fallen on their homes or their cars. These photos that you're looking at came to us from one of our viewers in Queens. The governors of New York, Connecticut, and New Jersey say they are getting help from the federal government. Tomorrow, President Obama will be in New Jersey to see the damage firsthand alongside Governor Christie. Raf, Tonight, New York is a city struggling to get back on its feet. Lights are on in some parts of town, but electricity is off in huge areas of South Manhattan and the outer boroughs and all across Long Island. Cabs are running, but there are no subways and only limited bus service. It's all making it next to impossible for many of the millions who live and work here to manage even the most basic tasks. Bridges and tunnels closed in massive flooding and 90 mile an hour winds. Fires erupted in Queens, destroying more than 80 homes. And late this afternoon, Mayor Michael Bloomberg put Sandy's destruction in perspective. We have a plan for recovery, and that recovery is already beginning, I'm happy to say. It's the beginning of a process that we all know will take a while, but um, this is uh, the uh, end of the downside, and hopefully from here it is going up. In New Jersey, it's kind of a difficult situation. How can you actually convey the devastation in the sweep of this storm? Only with pictures. And take a look at what we've got for you. More than two and a half million people are without power across the state. Six people dying as a result of the storm. Towns underwater. And Atlantic City? That's the boardwalk, or what was the boardwalk. People are staying in shelters. The National Guard, local police spent the day rescuing flood victims and looking for anybody else stranded in the flooding. And as the wind drove the waves on shore, Sandy took out beach towns, boardwalks, and the actual coastline from Cape May to Hoboken. Uh, aerials that you're looking at, they're coming from a tour of Governor Christie that he took up and down the coast. And there's so many more pictures to share with you. It's hard to imagine where the towns were. Many people describing the area as looking like a moonscape. And after the governor finished his tour, he had this to say about what he witnessed. Uh, it was an overwhelming afternoon for me, emotionally, uh, as a kid who was um, uh, born and raised in this state and who uh, spent a lot of time uh, over my life both my uh, childhood and my adult life at the Jersey Shore. Uh, we'll rebuild it. No question in my mind, we'll rebuild it. Um, but for those of us who are my age, uh, it won't be the same. And some of the most astonishing pictures of all coming from the southern tip of New Jersey's coastline, the latest from NJ Today's Lauren Waco, who has been on the scene in Cape May straight through this terrible storm. Watch this. Downed trees block roadways. Gas lamps couldn't handle the wind gusts, all remnants of Sandy's fury. Sand accumulated overnight here in Cape May, anywhere from one to five feet. Check out this street sign here on Beach Avenue. City workers are doing everything they can right now behind me to push that sand back where it belongs. Gar Kerr is a lifeguard on this beach during the summer. It looks completely different. I mean, right now we're on Beach Avenue, but right now we're on beach. We're not on Beach Avenue, we're on a beach right now. Despite the amount of sand that blew over the seawall, Cape May's mayor says he's relieved there are no fatalities or injuries to report. City officials began assessing the damage at 4 a.m. this morning. What we found was uh, we are now at the point where we only have 
flood waters on the beachfront on Beach Avenue in the last eastern block at Wilmington Avenue. It's about six inches in height and we're pumping it down, so it's no imminent danger. The curfew is still in effect and police are monitoring the entrances into the city. People can leave, but they're not permitted to enter the seaside community. The mayor says over 90 percent of Cape May has electricity. This could have been devastation for the city of Cape May. We did everything humanly possible in planning and implementation, but we were still at the mercy of Mother Nature. We can clean it up, but we can't stop it. Brian Harron is an equipment operator for the city. He expects to work on this beach, pushing the sand off the street for at least three days. Oh, it's just long hours. You know, you get worn out, ready to go home, see your family, eat a nice hot meal. West Cape May resident Lisa Bernstein chose not to evacuate with her family. I think the town as a whole was fortunate. I, you know, I really, my heart goes out to the people in Atlantic City and, and New York City where they really took a hit. The majority of Atlantic City is underwater. It's a devastating blow to the gambling town, which has been fighting to transform its image and become the region's premier destination resort. Back here in Cape May, the mayor says he doesn't expect anyone will be permitted back into the city until Wednesday afternoon. In Cape May, I'm Lauren Wonko for NJ Today. We're going to take you up the coast right now into North Jersey. Rescuers there wading through waist-deep water in the town of Munaki, where 800 residents had to be rescued starting last night. NJ Today's Andrew Schmertz with the story of those dramatic events. In Little Ferry and Monaki, more than a thousand people, along with their dogs and cats, had to be carried and ferried to dry land, and then many taken to local shelters. The water level easily reached the first floor of many homes after a tidal surge from the Hackensack River swamped barriers designed to keep low-level areas dry. First responders, including the National Guard, came from all over the state. Even a National Guard truck ran into trouble. Those rescued say it was one of the most terrifying nights and then mornings of their life. The rain was crazy, but seven in the morning, the fire department pounded on our doors, got us all out. Then they took us by bus or by boat over here to Dunkin' Donuts because it was too high to walk in. And now they're escorting us out through uh, these trucks right here. So they're doing an amazing job. How high was the water? Oh man, my car's done. The water's about up to the handles. Well, last night I went back to sleep um, looking out and I, everything was flooded. Um, so this morning when we took a look outside again and our basement is completely flooded, um, I was trying to reassure the kids that we would be okay and we saw everyone getting rescued. We're doing the best we can as long as the kids are all safe. We have a lot of babies all together. We're three families. We all live on the same block, me and my sister and my mother and father. And we lost everything. The water started coming up to our main floors of our house. I'm going to take you over to nearby Newark right now, where NJ Today's David Cruz spent the night in that city, a city almost completely without power. Hear now his story of his night and day in the state's largest city and in nearby Lyndhurst. For a few hours, the Andros Diner on Ferry Street was the only place in town that was open. The rest of the ironbound was already black. Within just a few minutes, the rest of Newark was likewise dark. Over in the University Heights section, trees and power lines were down. We estimated the winds at maybe 70 miles an hour, gusts the speed of which were confirmed by the National Weather Service. The police patrolled the streets, which were mostly empty, as the state's largest city cowered in the face of a superstorm. On the way out of town, the turnpike was dark and strewn with branches and debris from the Meadowlands. In Lyndhurst, much of the town, including our hotel, That's was water. without power as the Hackensack stormed into the area. This morning, the Quality Inn across the street lost power. The ground floors flooded, knocking out sewer and other emergency systems. The Lyndhurst Fire Department safely escorted 100 or so guests, including some in wheelchairs, to waiting buses, which took them to other hotels or nearby shelters. Compared to the devastation down the shore, these people were lucky but they were victims nonetheless of a devastating storm that struck the Garden State with indiscriminate and deadly ferocity. In Bergen County, I'm David Cruz, NJ Today. In New York, it was a day to survey the damage, and for some, a day to figure out how to get started on recovery on their own. Metro Focus correspondent Rick Carr was in Brooklyn today, where he found true New Yorkers doing what they do best, coping. 
Aviation High School in Long Island City was a designated shelter site for thousands of residents who were under mandatory evacuation orders during the storm. In the end, only 18 showed up, including Nathan Bracey Jr. The retiree hoped to get a lot done in the wake of the well, storm. Well, first I have to go to court and pay, unfortunately, a, a bicycle riding ticket. <laughs> then I'm going to come back here and find out what the situation is with this, uh, if they're going to stay open until uh, maybe tomorrow when school begins again. And then I have to run over to uh, my location to find out if the evacuees are back. So I'm going to have a pretty busy day. How are you planning to get around today? Unfortunately, I have a few bucks in my pocket. I'll take them. The buses and trains are running, I hope. Uh, I don't think so. Oh, my goodness. I'm going to have to do a lot of walking then. Left, right, left. <laughs> Long Island City's waterfront along Newtown Creek, from which Bracey had evacuated, was coping with post-storm problems of its own. It's a little over 12 hours after the peak storm surge hit, and the Newtown Creek is still a good three or four feet above its usual level. You can see from the debris that's caught in this chain link fence here just how high the surge was when it came over the flood wall here in Greenpoint. This is the water that flooded Greenpoint, Long Island City on the other side of the creek. And the folks who got hit by those flood waters don't just have to worry about water damage. They also have to worry because according to the federal government, Newtown Creek is full of toxic waste. Allison McGuffin lives a block from the creek and woke up this morning with more than a foot of that contaminated water in her basement. My husband has said to my kids, like, don't play in the water. Like, don't, if the water comes up, we're not, because we I guess there's been several warnings about the danger of the water. In the Red Hook neighborhood of Brooklyn, residents' love of their maritime setting was being tested. Water from New York Bay still stood several feet deep in parts of the area. Con Edison crews were jumping from pole to pole in an effort to restore power to thousands of customers who still lacked electricity. That left some residents to rely on human muscle to bail out flooded basements. And neighborhood resident Richard Moreland wielded a chainsaw to clean up a mess that Sandy had left behind. Like, it started all these people helping. It started one person taking a photograph. He put, uh, stopped taking photographs, stopped helping, then other people just came and pitched in. As simple as that. And after you're done with this tree, you're going to look for more? Yep. <laughs> I'm Rick Carr reporting. You know, there are many ways to get help tonight, but there are also many ways to give help. The Red Cross can be reached on its national 800 numbers and on its website. But there are specific offices here in New York and New Jersey. Both need your donations and your help. In New York, the volunteer organization, New York Cares, will connect you to the projects that match your skills and your time. The mayor's office has NYC service where you can register to volunteer. And if you need shelter, check out our Google crisis map. The website is here on the screen and at metrofocus.org. No doubt about it, this hurricane has been epic, but scientists have been looking into this very possibility, a storm moving up the coast and making that left turn right into New Jersey for a while. Joining us now is Adam Sobel, professor of Earth and Environmental Science at Columbia University here in New York. Uh, professor, good of you to join us. Okay. The, uh, the anticipation of the storm making this turn, but this storm making this turn with this level of ferocity, you expected this sooner or later? Well, uh, sooner or later, uh, I mean, we always knew it was possible, but it's an unusual track. What was really remarkable about it was that some of the computer models we used to simulate the weather predicted it as much as a week in advance. Um, not all of them did. There was some disagreement about them, about what would happen, and as time went on, they came into greater and greater agreements, such that the forecast was pretty certain a few days before. But, uh, but a week before, we knew that it was a real possibility, and that's, um, that's due to great improvements in, in, in technology of modeling these systems and predicting them. And, and Professor, what are the factors that converged to create this monster storm? So the factors were uh, a tropical cyclone, Hurricane Sandy in, in the Caribbean, um, which is not that unusual by itself for this time of year. It's a, a, a still hurricane season. And uh, as that came up the coast, um, came up not the coast, but up the, through the Atlantic uh, to higher latitudes, normally as it comes over cooler water, the storm would weaken. And Sandy did do that for a little while. Then it started to interact with a disturbance in the jet stream, an extratropical trough or winter type storm. And as that happened, um, it started to gain energy from it. A, a tropical cyclone like Sandy gets its energy from the warm ocean, whereas a winter storm gets its energy from the jet stream. So it's two different sources of energy. And it's, even that is not that unusual. 
Uh, it happens from time to time that as tropical cyclones go north and start to recurve, uh, they, um, they get energy and transition into more winter type storms. What was unusual here is that rather than going out to sea, which is what normally happened, the, the jet stream was so disturbed that the winds pushed the cyclone back into, into shore. So you, you describe a situation there that sounds rare, unusual. But then we're tempted to say, you know, we've seen so many rare, unusual things in the not too distant past become a little more regular. Are we talking about a possibility here that what we just witnessed right now is, is a, I guess, a little hint as to what's to come? It's a really difficult uh, question and an important one that doesn't have a simple answer. On the one hand, we know the climate is warming. We know that that um, will lead to more extreme uh, weather of, of various types in the future. Um, and so one shouldn't discount, discount uh, climate change as a factor in events like this. At the same time, we also know that it could have happened in a, in a climate that weren't changing um, and that uh, a lot of the factors that are in place uh, are, can occur naturally. And so um, you can't blame uh, warming climate for this storm. On the other hand, you can't totally rule it out. I think the part that, that is clear is that what we do expect in the next 100 years or so is that the climate warms, the sea level will rise. And that means that even if the storms stay the same, there's a higher probability of a, of a, of a high they flood like this. They don't need to rise that much up to do this kind of damage. Then. If they rise a little and then you get a storm of the same strength, you'll get a higher surge altogether. And, Professor, talk about the surge, the role it played in this monster storm. Well, that's what really made it such a devastating event, really. I mean, if it were just the wind and the rain, um, we probably would be almost done talking about it by now. And, and that was, the, the high surge was really due to this funny track that it took taking the left uh, turn in because it, as it came into the shore to our south, moving from the east to the west, which is such the unusual path, it put us on the right side of the storm, which is where the strongest winds are, and it also meant that the wind was blowing into the shore, um, which is the worst way to pile up the water. And um, because it was moving slowly and because it was so large, the wind had a lot of time and a lot of room to build up that, that huge storm surge. When does hurricane season end? <laughs> hurricane season I hope so. ends. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. There's another few yeah. weeks left. Uh, ends in 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 the end of November. But the but fact that this came this late in the season was that a surprise at all? The, the getting a tropical cyclone this late in the season is not by itself so unusual. I mean, it's been an active season, and sometimes you wouldn't have any more at this time. But that by itself is not freaky and and can't be attributed to the climate change. There's still even time for another one or two. Now it's really the fact that it that it underwent the, the transition that it took and that it got here at that angle that really made it so unusual. Now, Professor, you said that the models were predicting this perhaps a week, even a week ahead of time, but did it predict the severity, how tough it was going to be? Actually, some of them predicted it stronger than it, really? than it would be, than it turned out, but that's a typical thing that, that happens at, at those long, um, long lead times, we say, and so uh, that, you know, we didn't necessarily put much credence in that, but, but yes, um, as I say, it, it wasn't a prediction that we were confident in yet, because when the different predictions disagree, we don't necessarily believe them. But that scenario was there. And suddenly the idea of a Category 1 versus Category 4 storm, the comparisons, the inferences, don't seem quite so <laughs> right. significant anymore. Right. That's right. The, the, category, the categories um, on the Saffir-Simpson scale, which is 1, 2, 3, 4 that we're used to, those really measure the strength of the strongest winds. And so a Category 1 storm is not strong enough to do the catastrophic damage that anywhere near Unless that a higher until category it un until it's this really the surge and that's why that scale of measuring hurricane intensity is not really adequate to measure the potential for damage it depends on so many other things professor sobel thanks for coming in Pleasure. it's been a crazy situation for all of us a tragic for many but it's good to have you here to explain how we got to where we are thank you sir thank, thank you professor you. thank you well this is the city that never sleeps but last night new yorkers were taxed beyond their usual resourcefulness sandy hit hard and hit fast the water came up into the streets and over the banks take a look at some of the photos now these are photos that are from the website uh, North Atten run by students at the Columbia Graduate School of Journalism. In Midtown Manhattan today, we found business owners and a man who spent the night in a shelter uh, sharing a rather common story of community. Um, I'm glad that we were able to open to help out the community, uh, what he needed. Um, I already received a lot of phone calls from our customer to check out if we open so they can come in to, refill, to refill their prescription to buy the product that they need to buy. So um, that's really um, um, touching. 
candles, milk, uh, flashlights, double D batteries, D batteries, very, very popular. Oh, we're a neighborhood store, so we get to know the neighbors more with certain events like this. You know, and we always like to take care of the people in the neighborhood. That's why we try to stay open as long as we can. So far, everything has been kind of cordial. You know what I'm saying? Uh, they feed you, uh, give you a cot, like you're in the army or something, and uh, that's pretty much it. They have bathroom facilities, but for the most part, it's kind of like a, a shelter set up. I mean, it's like I see people from all walks of life in this place. So it's not really a, 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 a issue of um, status. It's more of like, like an issue of uh, survival. For everyone in this city, the shutdown of the subways, trains, and buses is a shock. Now we know that the storm surge has caused the kind of damage that the subways and trains cannot recover from quickly. This afternoon, I got an update on the transportation in New York, uh, Long Island, and Westchester from the MTA spokesperson, Kevin Ortiz. Can you tell us about the tunnels leading in and out of Manhattan? Uh, well, uh, in essence, you know, in the period of a few hours last night, seven East River subway tubes sustained some substantial flooding. You know, in terms of a storm surge that really, really wrecked havoc on, on our tunnels. That, along with uh, two Long Island Railroad tubes that link Manhattan and Queens and uh, two vehicular tunnels, the Brooklyn Battery, you Carry Tunnel, and the Queens Midtown Tunnel, all suffered uh, severe flooding. Now, the governor uh, said earlier, Governor Cuomo, uh, that getting the trains running again would be a yeoman's undertaking. Tell us, what's involved? Uh, well, that's exactly right. Uh, well, the first process is uh, is to pump the water out of these uh, tunnels. That's a massive undertaking uh, involving some pretty complex equipment and pumps. Uh, you know, we've got pump rooms, uh, portable pumps, and even pump trains that help to pump water out of these uh, out of these tubes. Now, uh, once that's done, and again, that can range anywhere between um, you know 14 hours to four days, depending on the severity of of the flooding down there. Uh, then we have to go in and uh, essentially inspect every Every inch of the system, uh, make sure that all components are working, and then at the same time make any necessary repairs before we can even restore service. And by the way, when you pump that water out, where does that water go? Uh, you know, that's a great question. Uh, it goes out somewhere, but I couldn't tell you exactly <laughs> where, it, where it goes. Uh, but definitely not back into the tunnel. That much I can tell you. And do you have any sense uh, about the, how much damage was done to the subway system? Uh, this is um, pretty much uh, the worst that we've seen, um, you know, probably dating back to the onset of uh, the opening of, uh, of the system, which is 108 years old. Um, just to put it in perspective, the last time we saw um, flooding that forced us to close, um, you know, a tube was back in in 1992 uh, as a result of a uh, nor'easter that essentially filled some tunnels with water and uh, we were forced to close the Canarsie tube which carries uh, the L line under the East River and that was out of service for a couple of days um, but this is much more substantial than that. Now I know you talked about uh, Long Island Railroad and Metro North what's the conditions of those tracks? Both railroads essentially um, have issues uh, with uh, with track power and, and signal power, so there's really no timetable in terms of when we will be able to restore um, service on those railroads as well. Uh, for Long Island, as I mentioned, there's flooding um, in two of the East River tubes, um, and along Metro North, what they did was they uh, dispatched some um, diesel power patrol trains on all three of the uh, Metro North lines, um, inspecting tracks and you know removing trees along the way. Um, as a footnote, in Austin, um, these uh, you know this patrol train encountered um, part of a 40-foot boat that was uh, blocking tracks uh, near Austin. Uh, so that gives you a sense of um, of some of the stuff that we're dealing with. New Yorkers who want to know the status of public transportation tomorrow, how do they find out? Uh, well, the best way um, is to log on to our website, mta.info. That will provide the latest updates in terms of uh, service and service restorations. And real quickly, just as, a, as an aside, we do plan on restoring bus service, partial bus service, today with a full schedule of bus service uh, tomorrow come Wednesday. All right, Kevin. Well, thank you so much. We know it's a busy day for you, probably a busy week, maybe a busy month. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. And the power companies, they are struggling tonight. Close to 4.5 million customers are without power, and that really means, translates from customers into people, millions and millions of people without any electricity tonight. Here are the numbers that you're looking at, the latest outage numbers, and you can see whether it's Con Ed in New York City or LIPA on Long Island or in New Jersey or Connecticut, it's bad news. Tonight, Governor Christie gave them a grade. Incomplete. 
The flooding and winds closed roads, airports, bridges, and tunnels. Tonight, almost all roadways are cleared and open, but there are still major bridges and tunnels closed to traffic. Here's a list of what is still closed, including the George Washington Bridge and the Holland, Midtown, and Brooklyn Battery Tunnels. And a reminder that President Obama will be in New Jersey tomorrow to see the devastation firsthand with Governor Christie. It will be another day of cleanup and for millions, another day without electricity. And if you need help, we have information for you on our websites, njtvonline.org and metrofocus.org. If you can volunteer to help, we have that information too. And please, check on your friends and neighbors. Because there are many of them in desperate need tonight. Little by little, as you've seen tonight in New York, in New Jersey, and throughout the entire Northeast region for that matter, people are trying to pull together and they are desperately looking for solutions. Many people will need help for months to come. And as we learned after the tropical storm last year, many people may need help well beyond many months. Homes have been destroyed, businesses have been lost. The basic infrastructure, the one that supports one of the world's greatest metropolitan regions, is seriously damaged. You've seen the pictures tonight. You know what we're talking about. This is real. So please stay with us here on 13 and NJTV on all of our websites. We're going to continue to bring you the kind of reporting that gets well beyond the headlines and tackles the issues and the stories you won't see anywhere else. The big story coming up tomorrow, of course, the president coming in to meet with Governor Christie in New Jersey and to tour the region to see how bad things really are. This will be significant. I'm Mike Schneider. For Rafael P. Roman and everyone here at NJTV and Metro Focus, we thank you very much for watching, and we bid you... Good night. We now rejoin our regular programming, already in progress. On Tuesday, man's best friend gets a second chance. Yeah, I'd like to fill out some papers. As these four.